Good morning. My name is Albert Whale. I'm the President and Chief Security Officer of IT Security. Today's presentation is entitled, Is a Firewall Enough Security for Your Business? Presentation today will discuss firewalls as well as hacking activities that the attackers are currently using to decide whether or not you're sufficiently safe with a firewall protecting your business. I, I'm hopeful that you'll understand as we move through this presentation how significant the attacks can really be. So let's get started. Here's what we'll cover today. Um, we're going to first discuss when was security uh, first dis decided to be a concern. What did we do for security in the past? Present day security implementations as well as compliance standards. Uh, we're going to talk about web security and web services for security as well as software security standards. Um, I think that the resounding theme or the resounding theme here is security and software and hardware. So let's let's see what's going on. So let's find out first when did security first become a concern? Think about this because there are many different times in our history of civilization that we've looked at wanting something else from other people. And that's when security actually started. And if you look through this list, I'll give you three seconds so that you can get a good understanding of what's there. Maybe you can pick something or have something else that you think is the actual start of security. Okay, so if you've gone through the list and you've heard what I was saying, you'll understand that it was none of them. Security actually started when cavemen discovered fire. <clears throat> this point in time, <clears throat> when cavemen discovered fire, was when the other cavemen wanted fire too to nurture his um, family's food and, and provide warmth and shelter so that they could survive the ice age and, and cook their meat and have light and all the benefits of having fire. So security's been around with us certainly since man has evolved. And shouldn't our security as well? So as men have evolved, so have the TV shows. Recently, as far as 2007, a TV show called Caveman was on TV that talked about the differences between cavemen and common day men. And of course, it's now over. Um, you can look up that show if you're interested in it. So looking at the past, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so let's resume. This is a look at the internet back in 1977 when it was first adopted as an ARPANET, a research um, networking opportunity that allowed dissimilar computers. Here we see DEC PDP-10s and PDP-11s, um, DEC 2050s, SPS 41s, Univax, and all kinds of other computers that were first networked together in one of the largest undertakings that this country had developed. These computers were all talking together from universities such as Stanford to military bases such as Gunter and MITRE organization, which is a military contracting company, so that they could exchange data and they wanted to make it so that information could flow three, freely between systems no matter where they were located. And that is ARPANET. Um, as ARPANET evolved later in 1981, so did the number of hubs or um, locations. And here's a brief view of the United States with the ARPANET superimposed upon it. If we were to take a look at today's internet, um, and look at the globe, it would just be a wash with coverage. Um, all this dead space that you see in the country now is no longer there. It's, it's fully engulfed. We've encompassed the globe with it. So what were required for us to have connections on the ARPANET? <clears throat> because it was so new, we had to have um, customized equipment. 
special interface cards were put together for computers. Dedicated communication lines ran point to point to all computers. They had to develop customized software. They didn't have drivers that allowed people to get onto the internet through their computer just by plugging in a device. Um, most of the equipment that was being used were supercomputers. And in 1986, that's when the internet started to become publicly available. After the ARPANET and DARPANET, um, the government funding decided that it was mature enough and it allowed the general public to get on it. So the initial connections for the public started out at 110, 300 baud, and commercially people got on when they had um, a 1K or 2K modem, all the way up to 56K baud modems, and that's dial-up speed. Today we enjoy much faster um, communication speeds. Uh, and we're running at gigabit speeds, logically. Uh, my connection to my house is using fiber optics, so communication speed is not an issue. Um, protecting that communication now becomes an issue. So how did we do that in the past? Well, typically in the past, here's a general small business environment. We had a hub or a switch. Hubs transmit all the data so that each of the computers will get a, a copy of the packets. But we found that that was a little more problematic for communication and it flooded networks, especially if two computers were talking. All the computers were busy in deciphering what was going on between those two computers. Um, but interfacing between the public inter internet or public network here is a firewall and that firewall was typically the protection from the commercial business and the internet and that's how things started out <clears throat> this is about 1994 and and the security here was built into the firewall okay nothing inside the network had anything that denoted security as a matter of fact it resembles this this is security implementation from back in the days of knights, um, King Arthur realm. This is a traditional brick and mortar defense, we call it, and we put all of our defenses on the outside to protect what's inside the building. Um, because all of the hardening goes on the outside of the environment, we call this a, an M&M &M defense. It's a, got a crunchy, hard shell for an external um, facing environment to the elements and, and your attackers and if you get inside it's sweet and chocolatey and there's no more defenses that's why we call it m and so that brings up um, where we are coming up currently these different pictures we have the stock exchange a gaming console um, looks like a flip phone, a microwave. These Oakley glasses actually have um, a, a camera in it with Wi-Fi. Um, here's a car, uh, PDA before they integrated PDAs into cell phones. Do you remember those days? A computer and a monitor. What do all these things have in common? Oh, here's a locket. This locket has a USB device that allowed people to go um, undetected into areas and connect to computers with the USB device and allow the the hacking team to get internal access to the computers they want to get. So ha have we, oh in a coffee pot, have we come up with something that all of these have in common? Well let's take a look. How about software? All of these devices require software in order to run them. So going back to the computer and monitor, this is a recent, very recent, um, November 2017, posting that I performed about an exploit that was discovered by Red Ball Security. The exploit is actually on your monitor, not your computer, which is kind of counterintuitive um, from what you'd normally see. But as you can see in the image, what you really have is a file that looks like a web page, then and the attack is actually exploiting something from PayPal. And what they do is they mask the file name 
with the actual image of what would it look like if you were connected to PayPal. Okay, so they cover up the actual exploit, which is on your computer. They've downloaded it through email or maybe you clicked a link somewhere. And now they're going to tell you that you're actually connected to PayPal. And this attack, as you can see, I had 770 views in three days. That's pretty good. Um, this attack actually exploits the computer in your monitor. I don't think many people have really expected that their monitors have computers in them. But in order to control the contrast, the resolution, and other factors that help you see what's going on in your computer, they require a CPU. And because they require a CPU, that CPU can be hacked. Now, there's hope. And with implementing controls for security in your environment, you can mitigate a lot of these extraneous issues so that your monitor isn't the first line of um, hacking. By doing certain things, and, and maybe we'll get to a few of them, we'll identify how we can mitigate some of these issues. So let's move on. Present day, um, talking about our computers. The internet connections in our home and car and workplace follow us everywhere. They're persistent and they have independent sources, so they follow us no matter where we are. It used to be that you'd have to dial up a connection, and it was only available when you wanted it to be. So because it's always there, we can no longer ignore software security. And software, as we saw earlier, runs on all of our hardware. So how do we get security started? Um, well, the government came up with some compliance standards. And to start off with, the healthcare industry um, has the HIPAA Act, which was enforced or created in 1996. It's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, that helps protect your healthcare records, but it's only a start. And as we've heard in many times and many places, um, healthcare records are very sought after pieces of information because the hackers can sell them to other people that don't have health care and make money at it. Sarbanes-Oxley came through in 2002 um, as an act to protect investors improving the accuracy and reporting of corporate disclosures. Some people call it SOX. Excuse me. The Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002 came out to help government systems excuse me came out to help government systems become more compliant and more secure by providing standards FISMA works with the government operations um, and entities that are done with the US government and many people have used payment cards payment cards debit cards credit cards that is controlled by the payment card industry data security standard that's come out in 2004. I'm sure you've heard of all the breaches that occur in the payment card industry, the um, transmission of data, and things of that nature. The PCI DSS standard tries to help ensure that businesses are compliant with security implementations. Now, the one thing to bring up about compliance is that there are many compliance standards, and they're ever-evolving. But we even have a company called Compliance Standards, LLC. And the one, th one takeaway I want you to have on this slide is that being compliant never made anyone secure. Because of all of these compliance issues that we have coming through from federal government and other agencies, these are starting points for security. Having a compliance program gets an organization involved in security operations, but it doesn't make you secure. You have to take steps beyond being compliant in order to become secure. <clears throat> I told you we'd talk about web services and security. Over here on the left is an ISO model. This is an inter interoperability uh, layer. Uh, the communications on the internet take through seven different layers of 
development to get the traffic that you see on Facebook, LinkedIn, and your email. And suffice it to say, you don't need to know this information because it exists and it's been employed by electrical engineers that help develop the ARPANET and things of that nature. We utilize all of this up at the top level for our applications. And our applications actually have different transport protocols, different messages and schema that we utilize, the services like WSDL and WS, um, the content, the server sessions that help manage it and, and help you follow your connection from one session to another or one wireless access point to another. And that helps bring in the logic for the application itself. So these web services all have um, different implementations for the security in the software. Now, another standard that has come up in current days is from OWASP, the Open Web Application Security um, Program. This nonprofit organization has developed a list of vulnerabilities that have brought critical thinking to uh, software developers and security analysts on why are our applications getting hacked, why are they breaking, and how is it that hackers are getting in. The last rendition was 2013. The 2017 edition just recently came out. There were three replacements on the top 10 vulnerabilities, and those replacements I struck out just like the date 2013. So there hasn't been a whole lot of change. There hasn't been a whole lot of change. And that shows you how significant the problem is. We still have injection problems, broken authentication and session management, and cross-site scripting. And that's only the top three. So with those issues not going away in four years or even moving down the pike, we have certain um, security issues in software. Another way of looking at security software standards are pernicious kingdoms. Pernicious kingdoms were developed by Dr. Gary McGraw from a company called Sigital. Sigital actually developed the software scanning tools that are being used by HP Fortify today. Now, just like OWASP has their top 10 or top 25 vulnerabilities, Sigital developed seven pernicious kingdoms. How to look at faults and defects in software. And they stuck these categories together, input validation, API abuse, security features, errors, and you don't really need to know this because as non-security professionals, you should know that the security professionals and the developers are being taught about how to analyze software in different ways. Now, because the seven pernicious kingdoms weren't enough, we found out that the environment could be different in different computers and the load library path could change or different features in the environment, which makes software run differently as well. So we have seven pernicious kingdoms plus the environment. Moving on. I've talked about software insecurity, and now I'm going to show you how easy some of these features are to exploit. This first video is about going shopping for um, this part, CLMPF, and this was done on Price Grabber. This video doesn't have any audio, so I'm going to walk us through it and talk to you about what's going on. So we have a product that we want to get pricing for. And we're going on Price Grabber to figure out what it is. You can see it's a projector lamp with a base price of $272. And there are several places that we can buy this from. And we're going to look at the best price uh, location, CompuNet Solutions. So we open a browser. And the browser points us to this um, product here at a price of $272. Well, we notice up above in the URL that there's some additional fields up here. Have you ever looked up there to see what's going on? There's some tools that we can use which will help us see this better, but the ID number is probably the part, and the SID or PK number here is probably some pricing information that talks about the part itself. So we're going to change this field, the PK number, 
and just modify one or two of the characters to see what happens to the price. Watch, we changed the W to an N and refreshed it, and we didn't get much of a change, okay? So we're gonna come back and do a different change on it now. It was W-E-W, -E then it went to W-E-N. We're gonna change the N to, looks like an I. And look what happens. The $272 price moves down to $27. That's significant. And that's what is going on today on the internet by people who have websites that have insecurity built into their applications. And that's what I mean about, is your firewall enough security to protect your business today? <clears throat> so this is aggressive shopping. People that know how to do this um, shouldn't really get caught at it because I don't think it's legal, but it's also the shame on you. Um, professionals can go back to the business and say, look, you have a problem with um, the way you're handling this information. Perhaps In this video, I you should um, do something about it. So I'm going to the next video, and this one's called cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is XSS not CSS. CSS is already a three-letter acronym that's used for people that develop web pages. Cross-site scripting is a little different and I, I'm i gonna let the video play out because it does a great job of um, analyzing and letting you know what's going on. Or maybe not. As our attacker. Let's try this again. In this video, I will demonstrate stored cross-site scripting. Stored cross-site scripting occurs when a malicious user is able to store JavaScript for later execution. Let's log in as our attacker. The profile page is visible by the attacker and also by our target, the administrator. First of all, you should know that this is not a real application. This is a test application that analysts use to um, hone their skills and to determine whether or not they have a good understanding. This application doesn't exist out on the internet as far as you know. We know from our client-side validation video that we will have to circumvent the controls on the profile page, so let's start Tamper Data. So in this case, he's using a tool called Tamper Data. This tool allows communications from your browser to go through another application before it gets sent to the internet. That allows security professionals as well as hackers to modify what is being sent to the web server in the case of utilizing um, the web page that you're giving them. So let's see what happens. In Tamper Data, we will change the attacker's email address to a cross-site scripting payload and give the script tag a source URL of our malicious code. So we're changing his email address to an actual attack script. We'll submit the form and stop the tamper. The profile has been updated successfully. Here is the code that is contained within our attack.js file. So this is where the attack script points. It points to a document cookie. This is a function that um, developers, attackers, and security analysts use. It just has a pop-up window that gives us the session cookie so that we can steal it or show that we acquired something of interest. As you can see, it creates a new image with a source URL of attacker8000, our attack server, and passes the cookie as a path parameter. When executed, we will be able to see the captured cookie in this console window running on an attacker-controlled machine. Now let's log out and log back in as our target, the administrator. So this exploit was designed to attack the administrator when he gets into the application and actually views the account. When we view attacker's profile, we can see a broken image tag. I've used the image tag to help visualize the attack, but a hidden field would work just as well and be invisible to the victim. When we switch over to the console, you can see that we've captured the administrator's cookie, which can allow an attacker to log into the site as the administrator without having to authenticate with a password. That's cross-site scripting. 
How do we steal things that you don't know about that the developers have put into the application so that we can use that information? There's a couple other issues going on here. Let's look at briefly SQL injection. In this video, I will demonstrate some examples of SQL injection. The first example will be the login form. In this application, we store our user credentials in a database. The application determines if a login attempt is valid by selecting matching database records where the username and password match those recorded in the database. Let's look at the user authentication query and how it is structured inside of the code. As we can see, input from the user is simply concatenated with the query. It's not important for you to understand a SQL command, but be aware that modifying this command is the intent that the attacker is trying to employ. If he can control the command internally on the application, he owns Now everything. let's go back to our page. Knowing how the query is constructed, let's try to perform SQL injection. As username, we can provide the name of the user that we know of. In our case, it will be Peter. Assume that I do not know the password and would like to log into the system. Let me insert in the username field, Peter single tick dash dash, which results in this query. Notice the double dash comments out the rest the of the query, so the AND clause is not executed, the computer is effectively using making this the, the executed query. Gave the application. This will allow me to log in as user with username Peter, assuming that I knew Peter was a valid username. And now we're in as Peter. Now let's look at what would password. happen if we did not know the username. Inserting a single tick or a equals a dash dash as a username. Again, the double dash comments out the rest of the query so that the AND clause is not executed. In this case, the system will allow us to log in too, but since the user with given username does not exist and the Boolean expression is true, the system will fetch the first user on the list, which in this case is the admin user. These examples show how poor implementation of SQL queries can lead to application compromise by allowing attackers to easily log into the system without valid credentials. So it's easy to cheat the system <clears throat> and get on board to the application without actually knowing what's going on. Now this is the shock and awe that I usually gave the um, Air Force crews. In this I video, I will demonstrate some typical web security. browsing behavior. Let's log into our bank as Peter with password, password. Okay, we're logging into a banking application. Again, this isn't demonstrating anything that we know of directly that's available on the internet that you're aware of, but let's see how easy this is and how it could actually play out or has played out. Next, let's check our account balance. As you can see, we have a checking account balance of $3,042.23. We've just received a message from a friend telling us to go check out his new website. Let's do that in a new tab. So we're reading email. Well, this doesn't look interesting at all. While we're Let's surfing go back to the our internet. banking. Do you see any exploits on this page? It's an email you got from a friend, right? And Let's check look. our account balance once more. Now we're back at our bank. Well, something is right know here. It, we now only have two thousand forty two dollars and twenty three cents. How did this happen? So that's part one. Now we'll show you how it actually works. It appears that we've fallen victim to cross-site request forgery. To better understand this attack, let's first analyze how a legitimate funds transfer is handled on the Bank of Insecurities. We will use tamper data again to view the post parameters that are sent to the server. So basically we're going to show you how they did it. You don't need to understand other than the attack exploit came through the email that you read while you were online. and we're actually building a query here we see our post parameters before clicking the confirmation button on how to transfer funds after clicking confirm transfer we see in tamper data that a new field confirm has been added with a value of yes so this is how banks do the data transfer online the funds transfer successfully executed and we now have $3,042.23 in our checking account again. Now let's take a look at the page that contained the cross-site request forgery payload. 
Remember, Notice this the came image tag email. with the source pointing to the transfer action of Bank of Insecurities with all of the post parameters we saw in tamper data used here as get parameters. Take special note of confirm equals yes, which simulates the user interaction required by the transfer process. This means that any time we are logged in and load the attack site, funds will be removed from our checking account and placed into our attacker's account. While user interaction can help curb cross-site request forgery, it needs something else to be successful. So this is how things happen with software insecurity. Security not built into the applications. Let's take a look at another approach. Many of you have probably received emails with very long strings, okay? And in doing so, you'll also see something that looks like a bunch of garbage that you can't read, but the computer can. This is called an encoded URL. And attackers use the information in encoded URLs to actually hide what is happening behind the scenes with the actual URL they're sending you. And in this case, they're sending a document cookie, which is saying, send me your session data. So this Google dork shows how simplistic this issue really becomes because now we can talk about um, how do they learn this stuff. Hi, it's Willie1147 from YouTube and today I'm going to show you how to find SQL injection vulnerable websites using Google dorks. Okay, first of all, the guys from Canada He's recording a video so he can be famous among other script kitty hackers. And he's using a tool that everyone knows, our friend Google. So Google goes out and it scans the whole world. And it tells us about all the applications. And now he's going to go through and actually do a search in the Google database to find out which websites have vulnerable data so that he can break into them. Google dorks are a great way that can help you a lot in finding vulnerable websites and save you a ton of time so it's extremely easy to use basically you just go to Google or your Google search bar you go ahead and type in URL colon and your Google dork just goes here now you can get a ton of Google Darks from a giant list or you can use them from a uh, or you can make your own. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my Google Dork in which is product.php question mark ID equals zero. Now this can be easily modified. It's you can change the ID the number to something like 200 or 1 or change product to games or you could change pro games to news or you could just just go stick with products or product so I'm just gonna use a Google Doc product dot PHP question mark ID equals zero and I click search and it should give a large number of websites which can be SQL There's injection vulnerable what I like doing is opening these in new tabs open a bunch of these in new tabs and it's sl my internet's slow right now, so add a symbol after each one. And if it comes up with an error, it's SQL injection vulnerable. So this isn't vulnerable. This is vulnerable. I don't know about this one. And these two websites are vulnerable just by clicking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven links. Two out of seven links that are vulnerable. So it's an extremely easy way to find vul vulnerable uh, websites without looking through a list. Lists are... Us I don't find lists very helpful because they're either already defaced or they don't work. So I prefer using my own Google dorks that I made up and put them in the Google and click the results. I hope you enjoyed this video and please comment, rate, and subscribe and thanks for watching. So you may wonder how do people find out where the vulnerable sites are and now you know it's our friend Google. Well besides ScriptKitties 
um, recording YouTube videos, there are other tools which also take advantage of Google's data, such as Shodan HQ. In it, we can find results for computer systems with default passwords, um, Cisco IOS devices that haven't uh, been completely secured. And in this case, we're looking for Cisco IOS last modified um, statements on devices that were scanned on the internet. There's more than 582 responding as HTTP, which is a bad configuration use of the web um, traffic because of its insecurity. Uh, if there's no personally identifiable information, it's all public information, HTTP traffic is fine, especially if there's no login that's available to the user of the site. And here we find down in the top countries, there's 134 Cisco devices with the last modified um, presentation of data. And, and this is a security issue because now the attacker can come here and find out which sites they can pick on. Another way that attackers get you to open up to them is social engineering. And I'm gonna read through this because the language is a little odd and there's nuances here that help identify the issue. So this email is received by someone in the um, community um, and it came back from the admin saying after nine years of using Steam, now it's our birthday and we offer our gifts for this occasion. Our company offers you a game of your choice. Now take a look that it's Steam Powered is part of the message, which is a valid website, but the actual site is hosted by vinylmenon.com and I don't really know what that is, but the user comes back through a chat session and says, oh, can I pick any game? And the admin says, yeah. Can I have Skyrim? Because that was a new and upcoming game. And the admin says, pick from the website. What website? So um, the admin comes back and says, the one I gave you, this one, steampower.com. Just click on the link. Sorry. So the user says, why do I have to go there? If you're an admin, can't you just give me the game? I'm still getting used to their shorthand and communication of chat windows, but we're doing the best we can. So the admin comes back and says to confirm your account details, but I'm already signed in. Can't you just gift me the game? No, we have to confirm that you're the account owner because lately many accounts are being hacked. Huh, imagine that. So you must confirm it. The user says, why does it matter? And then the admin gets a little testy. Sir, please don't waste my time. These are the rules and I'm not the one who made them. If you want the game, you must do as I say, must do as I say. So the user says, can I ask you a question? The admin says, yeah. Is anyone really that dumb to be scammed by you? The admin says, yes. And that's why they're doing it. So in a recent bug crowd survey, this one was done just before a presentation I gave, November 18th, 2016. It asks about what types of security events are going on in your environment, in your business. Are you doing application security training? Are you teaching the people developing the software how to build security in? Do you do penetration tests? And I don't mean using a tool to find a scan to see how many servers haven't been patched because, well, we know servers need patched every Tuesday, right? Are you using application vulnerability scanners? And if so, are they being run by security professionals? Because most people who run scanners really don't understand the results or the findings or the configuration. And it's much more efficient to have um, cyber professionals run the tools for you and provide you with results and training on how to utilize the tool as well as the report information. When you're doing software development, are you doing static analysis? That's running the code through um, scanners, like I mentioned earlier, the um, HP Fortify tool is one of them. Very expensive tool, but you know, if you don't wanna be hacked, then you should invest in security because it costs significantly less than trying to fix a breach later on. Do you do code reviews? Do you have threat modeling? 
That's finding out where are the exploitable entry points for my network, my computers, my system, my application. Do you have an incident response process? When something happens, what do you do? Who do you call? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters won't handle this. Are you doing other activities? And if you are, what are they? And this was BugCrowd. BugCrowd does security scanning of applications that exist on the internet. And think about this for a minute because this is my point here. That means that the application is built and running, has been on the internet, has been scanned by Google probably at least three times a week, if not three times a day. And so the hackers have all the information about your application already. Doing it after an application is built is a little behind the curve as far as protecting your environment. You want to do it as you're gradually implementing these tools, not after the fact, because you can't bolt security on. It must be built in for it to be the most effective use of your time and your resources. So that's my presentation for today. Um, if you have questions, we're available for um, a free initial consult and our clients have been long-term clients for quite a while. We do cybersecurity, that's all we do, and we implement the best security practices for our clients so that they can stay out of the news. That's our goal, keeping you safe and secure, and we like to think we do a great job of it. You may not have heard of us in the news, but we do have some announcements on our website. Feel free to come by and check on them, and we'll be happy to talk to you anytime. Have a great day. I hope you learned something.